Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Gilbert Plost, Managing Director of the World Economic Forum, and I'm uh, responsible here for the Open Forum opening it today. I would like to welcome you all to this Open Forum. What does Open Forum stand for? I'd like to give you three points of uh, the raison d'etre of the Open Forum. It is, firstly, um, in favor of the same ideas and principles as the World Economic Forum itself. The challenges of our globalized, interconnected world cannot be dealt with by individual governments, uh, by individual organizations or businesses or non-governmental organizations alone. They alone cannot master the challenges that we face only together by making coordinated efforts between all stakeholders can we reach the responsible, meaningful answers that we are looking for. But this means that various stakeholders need to be invited to dialogue and that this can contribute to considering issue of great complexity. This means issues such as responsible leadership in times of crisis or music this evening, a very different subject, um, where we will be looking, looking at the difference between uh, old instruments and new instruments and what those mean. Tomorrow we'll be talking about uh, the risks of uh, a world without satellites, uh, whether that's uh, what that would mean, whether it's possible. We would talk about uh, religious tensions. The uh, remodeling of capitalism is something that we're going to address. Also issues relating to the uh, provisions of water, one of the greatest risks that we are facing. Or multiculturalism, that's going to be the final discussion whether multiculturalism has succeeded or failed. On all of these issues, you will be finding businessmen, businesswomen, uh, politicians, NGO members, uh, religious representatives, uh, or representatives from social organizations. That's what the panels are going to be made up of. That's the first point. The second point of what the Open Forum stands for is that it is a platform. It is a platform that is open to a broad, diverse public. It is ready for a genuine dialogue with various representatives of diverse interests and experts. It is here to consider and engage with different innovative ideas. I'm very happy to see so many young people in the room today. Um, I'm not just talking about my generation. I've seen um, whole school classes who are coming uh, from um, across Switzerland to take part in our discussions today. These then are the reasons that we are here. And the purpose is dialogue with leaders from business, politics, um, academia, uh, religions. We are here for a constructive approach to these innovative approaches uh, in the spirit of a respectful dialogue. The Open Forum was established in 2003. It was born of an idea um, brought about by the World Economic Forum and the uh, Federation of Swiss Protestant Churches, particularly its president at the time. They work together with other organizations uh, from civil society, fair trade organizations such as Max Havelaar or the Red Cross, which was there at the very outset. Over recent years, it has really focused um, on the FSPC and the World Economic, Economic Forum. Um, we've given it a new foundation with an advisory uh, panel which really tries to involve stakeholders in the uh, establishing of the program and the issues to be discussed and the guests invited. So I would like to thank everybody who's uh, participated in providing um, 
advice and input. I'd like to thank uh, Christian Burley from the ICRC, Hans-Peter Fricke from the WWF, uh, Gottfried Locher from the FSCP, who's um, here, Christa Markwalder, who's national councillor, uh, Patrick Odier, who's a representative from the Swiss Association of Bankers, and Mark Pete, who's an academic, who's uh, a member of the OECD Working Group on corruption in trade. The third objective which I would like is which I would like to mention is open respectful dialogue. What we want is a dialogue not only between experts in the panel but a, a dialogue with the public which fully involves the public. A dialogue for a constructive future oriented solution to solutions. And that also includes the possibility that viewpoints which might appear irreconcilable are all heard. I'd like, in that respect, to repeat what Alex Krauer said a long time ago. It was president of Sieber Geige in, a, in an address. It is as true today as it was when he said it. He said, dialogue means engaging seriously with other arguments, grappling with the content of these arguments in order to measure one's own standpoint. Understanding dialogue in this way doesn't guarantee that there will always be a consensus. It doesn't even guarantee that standpoints will be reconciled or come closer. If one only stand, um, if only one only seeks harmony, understanding at any price and agreement through harmony, uh, through dialogue rather, then that would be a gross misunderstanding. It is not the search for the lowest common denominator. It is rather the search for a space of engagement, which in itself facilitates change, movement, and development, and in doing so, avoids the danger of standstill. So let dialogue live. And to pursue our program, I give Lee Bollinger, president of Columbia University, to lead and guide our dialogue today. Thank you, Lee. Thank you all for coming. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, this is uh, clearly a, a very important subject at a very important time, thinking about leadership in times of uh, crisis. Uh, important. It's also highly elusive. That is very, very difficult to say very concrete uh, things about this, but we'll try to do our best uh, with this fantastic uh, panel. I'll give a very brief introduction uh, of each of these. We don't want to spend time uh, introducing well-known, very famous uh, people, uh, so we'll get right to that. Let me just say the following. Uh, I, I think we all understand that the uh, world has a kind of disenchantment uh, with leader, leadership in many countries and regions across the world, whether it's in the corporate sphere or the political sphere uh, or beyond. We understand that it's very, very difficult to be a very successful leader in this environment at the same time. The public discourse makes it uh, difficult to get through the noise and to actually speak to people. Uh, institutions that may have worked extremely well uh, decades ago uh, do not work so well now. And perhaps we don't have the structures uh, that permit who would be great leaders to be great leaders. So there are many, many things to, to think about on this subject. Uh, here are our panelists. Ehud Barak, Prime Minister of Israel from 1999 to 2001, currently serves as Israel's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Defense. Jean-Claude Beaver is the Chairman of the Board and former CEO of Swiss luxury maker Hublot, a company he joined in 2004 following his successful leadership of the Blanchpan and Omega watch brands. Gordon Brown was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and leader of the later part, Labour Party from June 2007 to May 2010. He also served as Chancellor of the Exchequer from 1997 to 2007. Martin Bird is the founder and CEO of Fondacion Paraguaya, 
a 25-year-old NGO devoted to the promotion of entrepreneurship and self-help to eliminate poverty around the world. He is also the co-founder of Teach a Man to Fish. Brian Koch is the head of marketing and customer solutions and a member of the group executive committee of ABB, a leading power and automation technology group based here in Switzerland. And Jean-Claude Trichet was president of the European Central Bank from 2003 to 2011. Now I think there, are, again, just to try to, to focus this conversation and to begin, I think we should with uh, Jean-Claude Trichet. What really is the essence of leadership uh, in your experience? Every person on this stage has been a leader, is a leader, has thought clearly about what great leadership is, especially in times of crisis. One sort of question to be addressed, and I think the second is how do we create leaders uh, in this new world? How do we educate them for the future? Either of those two questions or both of them, uh, but let's begin with uh, Jean-Claude Trichet. Thank you, thank you very much indeed uh, for your uh, presentation. I would say that uh, we should not forget that we are experiencing the worst crisis uh, in the advanced economy since World War II. I really trust that it could have been the worst crisis since World War I to the extent that the fragility of the system was uh, so great in 07 and 08, and without the resolve of the leaders in question, uh, and a number of them are around this table, including the prime ministers that were uh, in charge, uh, then we, we would have been again in, in an absolutely dramatic situation. So I, I'll say just one word on the crisis itself, then on how to be responsible in the crisis, and then a, a remark on, on prevention in general. Uh, the crisis was very much, very much uh, unfolding in an unpredictable fashion. And uh, what is the mark of uh, such crisis is that the, unfold, the succession of unfolding of events is extremely rapid, calls for very, very rapid analysis, diagnosis, as lucid as possible, and for immediate action. And that, that is something which is particularly difficult because uh, for such crisis, it's action that is not at all in the textbooks. You have really to, to make up your mind in a situation which, again, has not been foreseen. Uh, I have to say that for the central bankers, I can tell you there was no textbook that was recommending the kind of non-standard measures that we all had to take in the advanced economy on both sides of the Atlantic and in Japan. And uh, uh, clearly, clearly, this uh, uh, rapidity of the unfolding of events was exactly uh, uh, the same drama for, uh, for the political leaders. And they themselves had to embark on decisions that, uh, again, were in no textbook at all, which were not uh, in the mind of the people and were extremely bold. If this very bold decision had not been taken, again, I think that the house of cards of the financial institutions after the Lehman Brothers collapse would have totally collapsed. And again, we would have been in a situation which would have been the worst since World War I. A second remark would be that even in such circumstances, a responsible uh, leadership must keep a sense of direction. And that's the real difficulty have a sense of direction for us, for instance, maintain the credibility of price stability in the medium and long run at a time where markets are not functioning correctly and where you have to take non-standard decisions of first magnitude. So I would say it is the combination of the standard decisions, nam namely the interest rate decision, for instance, in our case, and the non-standard, namely supply liquidity on an unlimited basis at fixed rate, namely purchase of uh, securities, which uh, we, we did ourselves in a limited measure, which was done uh, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic uh, uh, for a very large measure. By the way, because on the other side of the Atlantic, the financing of the economy is made mainly through markets in our side of the Atlantic, 
it is made mainly through commercial banks. But this combination is, uh, is uh, something which is absolutely of the essence, because if you lose a sense of direction, then you are aggravating the crisis instead of helping uh, to solve it or to cope with it. And my last remark would be that uh, uh, and then I turn to the functioning of our democracies, and I would be very, very interested in having, in particular, of course, the sentiment of political men. Uh, it is the problematics of prevention when you are in an extremely grave crisis uh, that is unfolding, not there still, so that the people doesn't see the extension of the drama, but you have yourself a lucid analysis and you want to avoid the drama. And how do you do that when our democracies do, do not permit normally to governments to, to take decisions that uh, are too bold for the people? A very good example is on the other side of the Atlantic. I'm speaking the, uh, under your control, uh, Chairman. Uh, when the first TARP was refused by the Congress, clearly the sentiment of the people in the US was that after all, it was not that grave. When the executive branch had a clear sense that the house of cards was falling down. And it, it you know, it needed a little bit of pedagogy, a little bit of education, a lot of communication, and the evidence that the Dow Jones was falling like a stone for the Congress to accept the top measure. But it seems to me that uh, uh, it is extremely important to try to understand exactly how in modern democracies you can really prevent drama to unfold. You know, you mentioned uh, Lehman Brothers, and, and is it the case that we just didn't understand the full consequences, this, the massive consequences of the failure of that particular organization that would unfold? In other words, I'm, I'm interested in the theme that you began with, the problem of not having experience on which to, you have to invent things as it's unfolding. And, the, and, and is, that, is that consistent with your understanding of what happened here? We, just, we got into something, it, it broke, it, it was massive, and we, we were inventing as we went along. I, I think, I really think that uh, it was, of course, clear that we were in presence of a very fragile financial system. Uh, I really trust that there was not a, an underassessment of the gravity of what was unfolding. But in any case, it seems to me that at a time you had, you needed that experience yeah. in order to gain the force to try to arrest the tsunami. Yeah. And had Lehman Brothers would be saved, then the next online was AIG. Yeah. Had AIG been saved, then the next online would have been, right. you name it. Right. So, uh, no, the, the, the real issue is even when a, a tsunami is coming, and it is absolutely clear in the eyes of the executive branch, it is nevertheless difficult to take the decisions yeah. that are overdue but are not perceived by the public opinion yes. and by the political leadership necessarily. Gordon Brown, let's follow up with, uh, with that because we're on the <clears throat> political institutions and the economy and the need for decisive action that political systems don't seem to allow. Uh, w w would, you, would, would you expand on that, or is that consistent with what, how you see things? Well, well, let me say, first of all, what a pleasure it is to be uh, with the civic audience in, in Switzerland, and thank you for the welcome you've given to all the guests at the World Economic uh, uh, Forum. Uh, and I do appreciate the chance to talk about these big challenges that the world faces, uh, and uh, I hope we can have an interactive uh, d discussion. Um, there have been some huge decisions that have had to be made in the last 50, 50 years. Uh, clearly the end of the Cold War, clearly the end of apartheid. Uh, but now that we're talking about the financial system, what I think is the most significant thing, and why Jean-Claude Trichet, who did a a brilliant job, talks about a, a new world, is that we saw created in the last 20 or 30 years a global financial system, totally new. We used to have local financial systems, 
national financial systems. Now we have a global financial system. And we found out that there were problems associated with its uh, development uh, that required us to act. And if we hadn't acted, as uh, Jean-Claude uh, has said, we would have had a crisis that would have been bigger than the Great Depression of the 1930s. And that calls for leadership. Uh, when you diagnose a problem and you see that uh, something has changed that you've never had to deal with before, then it requires courage. And it requires courage to implement what are radical solutions to new problems that you've never really had to deal with uh, before. And therefore, I think, uh, and this is probably where you're trying to get to, Lee, I mean, what is the quality of leadership that matters most? I think it is courage. Uh, wisdom matters a great deal. Humility, I think, is incredibly uh, Im important, and it's not one of the qualities that is associated most with politicians, as you probably know. Uh, they usually would write books like Modesty and How I Achieved It, you know. <laughs> um, the, but courage, because you've got to uh, be in a position to take a firm stand, and you've got to be able to see it through. Uh, of course, you can have the right convictions, but you may not have the right determination to see something through. And of course, you could be determined to see something through, but you may not have the right conviction, so you need both. Uh, and I think what is needed in a crisis is people who are prepared uh, to take sometimes unpopular decisions, to see the long term and not just the short term. And I think the tension that we're in in this modern world, which I think most people, when they, when they look at it, will be aware of, is that some of the biggest decisions are global decisions that require global coordination now. You can't have a financial system that works now without there being global coordination. But of course, the judgment that's being made on decision makers is within a national framework. And so you're responsible to national electorates when you're trying to deal with what are global problems that require global solutions. And the second thing I think that is a real problem for all of us is that we're in a 24-hour news cycle. And so the short term always seems to matter more than the long term. Barack Obama once said he would rather be a good one-term president uh, than a bad two-term uh, president. And what he really meant there, he, may, he might not say that at the moment because he faces election, what you, what you but what he really meant there is you've got to take the long view, but the pressures are always on you to take the short-term view. And indeed, the pressures grow and grow and grow when you have a media that's a 24-hour media, but also you have pressure groups that are acting. They want immediate results, but actually some of the problems can only be solved by explaining that they're long-term and taking, and taking uh, long-term action. I think the final point I would make is, is, is just, uh, just this, and you'll probably cut me shortly, but it's this, this final point that 100 years ago, politicians uh, who were making decisions were not under huge pressures in the way that they are now. Uh, some of my predecessors in the United Kingdom, uh, Disraeli could write poetry for half the day and still uh, be the Prime Minister. Gladstone, my, one of my predecessors, ran what he called the Midnight Club for Fallen Women. He went out into the streets of London and tried to convert prostitutes. It was an amazing uh, story. I don't know what the newspapers would have said if he'd done it today. Uh, then uh, Rosebery was a Prime Minister, and whenever a cabinet meeting, which is the major decision-making body, clashed with a race meeting, he always chose to go to the horse racing meeting. That's how important he thought his job was. And, uh, you know, when President Kennedy came to the United Kingdom in 1961 to meet Harold Macmillan, our Prime Minister, amazingly, Harold Macmillan, the Prime Minister, was asleep and hadn't woken up when President Kennedy arrived at the door of Downing Street. And they had to waken up the Prime Minister, and President Kennedy had to be given a newspaper to read, and he had to wait for half an hour while the... Now, could that ever happen now without a major international crisis? So what I'm really saying is uh, we've moved from the amateur to the holy professional to the 24-hour cycle to the day-to-day, -day, but we've moved perhaps far too much to a short-term assessment of what is good leadership and bad leadership. And I think you've got to take long-term decisions. You've got to recognize we're in a global uh, world where lots of decisions are now uh, cannot be made without coordination between countries, can't just be made by one uh, country. And I think that's, in a sense, how the global financial crisis hit us. We had to quickly realize that without the cooperation that Jean-Claude was involved in with the Americans and others, you could not begin uh, to solve this uh, crisis. So the world is certainly very different. But I think the quality that is needed most is, is, is courage. 
uh, to be able to take a stand, to take a difficult decision, and to be able to see it uh, through. And therefore, the people that I admire most in uh, the history of the, uh, uh, the world are people who have shown uh, an amazing degree of courage. And it goes from Nelson Mandela to this day to Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma. People have taken difficult stands, known they were going to be unpopular, but they've had the courage, i.e. the determination and resolution to see it through. So Thank that's you. how I see leadership in the future. Thank you very much. Um, and these are very important uh, themes about the ways in which leadership has to exist within a political framework that is really too narrow for the kinds of problems that uh, are created. Of course, you wonder whether the opposite might be true on the last point, that writing poetry and doing public good at midnight and also sleeping during the day is the essence of what good leadership should be. I'm so the poetry wasn't very good either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. So we also have two uh, representatives from the, uh, from the business side, and let's turn to them, and each of them has had uh, great success at bringing uh, institutions, businesses that were not doing so well and making them extremely uh, successful. So Jean-Claude Beaver, would you uh, speak first about how you have seen leadership, uh, especially in times of crisis? I think what uh, Gordon Brown said uh, uh, is the point. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't more than agree with that. Uh, a leader needs vision. No vision, no future. <laughs> uh, and then, once he has a vision, he needs the courage to believe that this vision might be wrong, eventually. Because vision, how can the vision be true? Only God can give us a vision that is true. <coughs> but as a human being, we have a vision. But then, uh, we need courage, conviction. We must... And then we must implement. And you know, <clears throat> uh, these are the fundamental uh, behavior of any leader, if he is in the business or if he is in the politics. In business, to be a leader is, of course, much easier <laughs> because you are facing only a very small part of the people. You have a company, you have 10,000 people, so pff, that's nothing. Uh, a leader in politics. <clears throat> He has a country, and then he has the collateral. He has other countries, too. <clears throat> so being a leader in the politics has a total, it's a total another job um, than being in, uh, the leader in a company or in an in industry. Nevertheless, the qualities that are required are absolutely the same. I, and uh, Gordon made a brilliant uh, uh, definition of what is a leader. Now, what we, or what I have experienced, we, the Swiss, we have experienced the worst crisis that our industry ever had in the 80s, when the Japanese were killing us, but killing us. And we were 120 people, and suddenly we were 40,000, uh, because we had not negotiated the quartz, the, re the revolution, industrial revolution. And the Swiss were still making watches with their hands and making, trying to make watches accurate. When the Japanese came, boom, and they came with quartz that was more accurate, and the watches were very cheap. And the Swiss did not react quickly. Because we didn't react, we lost 80,000 jobs. And one day, we had a vision. And what was this vision? It was to say, if our salaries are so much more uh, cost, costly than the Japanese, then let's make watches with no hands, but with machines. And we are brilliant people in Switzerland. We will invent machines that are making the watch from A to Z, 100%. And the Swiss invented the Swiss watch. And the Swiss watch was called Swatch. And Swatch was a phenomenal answer, a uh, reply to this crisis, because we had the vision to make watches totally differently, to invent machines that had never existed. Never there was a watch that was made 100% by a machine. 
and Swatch, when you were visiting the, 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 the factory, there were 500 meters of machines and nobody in it. Just a guy on the computer checking. And every minute, bam, bam, thousand watches coming out in plastic. Bam, 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 bam. So that was the reply. That was the answer of a vision. And this vision and who I had a leader. And this leader with the vision and the whole country followed. And that is how we said um, we put the Japanese back to Japan. <laughs> and, they are, <laughs> and today, they are still in Japan. <laughs> so the vision is clearly Brian. <coughs> Bryce, I'm sorry. Thank you. Bryce. This is going down very well with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, coming, coming from a, Bryce. coming from <laughs> another side, a lot of machines too, but not an easy answer on, on leadership. I mean, if I if I recall correctly, there have been something like seventeen thousand books written about leadership, so it will need us something like forty seven years to read them. Might some of you might manage? I will not probably anymore. So it's not an easy answer just to state for from the beginning. Now. The experience we made in leadership in our company in ABB was at the time where ABB was a very well-known company, very well recognized, and I believe in Switzerland especially. And then suddenly we were very near bankruptcy. So it was a kind of institution falling apart. The way we believe we solved it was because of a few things. A very important one was the transparency. Communicate, explain, tell the truth, say where we are. Instead of making stories, instead of, of hiding, instead of playing games, whatever, just be transparent. Say where you are, take the heat. It's, it's cumbersome because it's a lot of questions coming behind that, but be transparent is one of the key things I would add to what Gordon and, and, and what my predecessors have just said, which I would agree to. The second one is be yourself, don't play games, which fits a little bit together with be transparent. Uh, be yourself, because as soon as you start to play games, you will, you will be recognized, people uh, see you through. They will see that you play, that it's not, uh, it's not me, it's not meant, it's not real, and therefore it will not work out. So the people will not trust you. And that's me, lead me to one of the key issues, or one of the key characteristics of, of a leader. He needs to be trusted. You need to trust in him. The guy, the person, the woman, the, the human being, need to put a picture, need to put a vision, coming back to what has been said before, which you can uh, federate people to, you can adhere to, you can identify yourself with that. Now, that federation, that picture, that's bringing people together and transparency, bring me to one of the key challenges which we are managing now today more and more on a daily basis, and I think government, even more than companies, as Mr. Beaver just said before, is social media. Social media is opening everything, is making everything transparent, and more importantly, immediate. So you absolutely, you don't have any time, any second. It is at the, at the light speed you get information spread all over the world. How do you manage that? In, only if you are transparent, and only if you are very fast, very quick. Look at how many crises. Monsieur Trichet just mentioned that before. We had to take very quick decision. And that is not just speeding up with the social media impact. We might come later back on that yeah. one. But that would be the two advices. Be transparent, be yourself. And the third one, be fast. Be damn fast. Thank you very much. And uh, we also have a representative from the uh, NGO world, Martin. Martin, you are in the process of, of helping people discover their talents. and. Uh, using entrepreneurship in particular as a form uh, of human uh, sort of uh, recovery. Um, so what do you find uh, is the most successful uh, examples of leadership in this instance? Well, thank you very much. I come from South America, and I want to tell the Swiss people that you have a very beautiful white country. <laughs> And uh, particularly impressed by the number of young people, the students who are here. And I would like to, to speak to the students because students sometimes are intimidated by political leaders or business leaders. And you say, how am I, I am just a 17-year-old young woman, 
How am I going to affect the world? And uh, the good news is that it is possible because there is a third sector, a new sector. So um, there is government and there is business, but then also us. And today, if we have a passion, if we are sincerely worried or concerned about a problem, and we think that we can have an opinion, there is a possibility to do that. And you can live in Switzerland and have an opinion about housing in the slums of Brazil. Because you are also part of Brazil. So you are no longer confined to Switzerland. And I was just telling my uh, members of the panel here, I come from a very poor country and we just opened an office in Tanzania in Africa. What's the difference between Paraguay and Tanzania? Nothing. It is the same people with the same problems. So um, find your passion, find your element. And they say that uh, this English educator, uh, Sir Ken Robinson, says that you must find your element. And your element is where your passion crosses with what you're good at. And there is the only place where you will... Um, learn, and in addition to what has been mentioned here, we must speak truth to power. That is what leadership is. Find the truth. What is really happening with a crisis in Wall Street? What is the truth? We need to challenge the system. We need to permanently question what they're telling us. Because if we let Wall Street continue with how they're acting, they will affect us. The young people are not going to have any jobs. So this is a concern for young people in Switzerland, for young people in South America, and it is a wonderful opportunity to express yourself. Very good. So we we'll want to make sure that at some point we talk. I want to make sure at some point in the discussion that remains we'll talk more about what young people can do and how they should be educated for this world. Minister Barak, uh, let's end with you for this uh, session, part, portion of the session. You've been a leader in a military context. You've been a leader in a political context. Uh, I'm sure you have thought deeply uh, about this subject uh, and about what's uh, what are the qualities in different contexts of leaders, and then what's the core? So we would welcome uh, hearing from you on this subject. Thank you. First of all, I'm uh, very glad to be here among uh, Swiss citizens and be able to exchange uh, views and listen to your questions. I'm coming from a totally different neighborhood, extremely tough neighborhood, nothing to compare with Switzerland in the last 400 years or so. Uh, that's a place where there is no mercy for the weak, no second opportunity for those who cannot uh, defend themselves. And we are, on the one hand, the source of the great prophecy of uh, Prophet Isaiah that the time will come at the end of times and the lion and the lamb can lie together. But as long as the practice is that the lamb has to be replaced every several days, we prefer and chose to be a benign lion. Uh, we, uh, we learned the hard way that leadership should stem, stem out of a, not just an inner drive to, to lead, which is something that any individual here uh, brought with him uh, probably from, from uh, birth, but a strong sense of direction, a strong intuition about uh, what should be done a strong uh, inner uh, compass. When uh, Gordon talks about courage, it's profoundly the courage of conviction. You could uh, see a great uh, example, uh, just personal example in the eruption of energies of uh, Mr. Beaver when he talks about the, the fight. You should bring with you this kind of, of uh, 
the combination of courage or conviction, uh, conviction together with the capacity to inspire hope. But basically, leadership exposes itself and expresses itself in times of crisis. And it is only where the deepest primal anxieties of human people as well as the masses are put to the, uh, pushed to the surface that real leadership uh, uh, is, is needed. And by those times, be it in the battlefield or in the economic crisis, uh, it's time where it's not easy to answer what is a leader. A leader is the one who can convince, in spite of all difficulties, to convince people to act not just against circumstantial odds, but against their very instincts, be it the political instinct or very survivability instincts. And it only happens when whole paradigms collapse in front of our uh, eyes. It happened to me several times when I saw during the height of, uh, of battles in the field how everything that everyone believed that should happen or could happen is broken and the total destruction, physical and, and uh, uh, human in terms of human life, is exploding around you, and only few can keep under those huge pressures, the kind of emotional detachment on one hand with an extremely alert sensitivity to objective feedback from reality that, that can enable him to keep the psychological uh, stability of the leader as a human being to be able to keep judging, to look out of the box and what's needed to be done, and never lose the, the core of leadership, which is not about contemplation, it's about action, it's, it's about deeds, not about uh, words. In leadership, ultimately, what really decide is character, you know, beyond certain relatively not extremely high uh, level of, uh, of intelligence which is needed, to understand the world, it's basically about character more than about uh, IQ. It's about the, the nature of the individual. And uh, in this regard, you know, the, the human capacities, the psychological pressures, the capacity to, to operate alone. Leaders, uh, I am confident that Gordon uh, remembers him from many moments, concrete moments, and Trichet remembers him from concrete moments, and the same applies to anyone here uh, on the stage, probably many of you, that you end up being alone, alone. You understand it, you hear many feedbacks, some of them are distorted consciously, some of them are distort distorted subconsciously, but you have a huge responsibility and you have to make decisions. It's about the nature of the financial system and how, how uh, far it was drifted by greed and, and other elements and, and by the loopholes that were in the system in, by, by extremely competent players uh, to the uh, uh, other questions that I face, how to deal, how to actually deal with the challenges around Israel from the Hamas that in Gaza that, that uh, accumulated the... Uh, thousands of rockets to the Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon, a proxy of Iran, that, uh, a militia that had 50,000 rockets and missiles to cover all Israel and running their own independent uh, uh, policy, and not to mention Iran in the, hovering in the background as a major challenge and the daily terror threats all around the world. We are focused in it. We know that we, are, we will have to make many decisions practically alone, even if formally you have some form to uh, go to. And I think that in this moment, what I have learned from experience is that many, many people, very good people, sometimes under the overwhelming pressures of reality, of the collapsing world of, uh, uh, and, and uh, paradigms, lose sight of what they are trying to do to accomplish at what should be done. And because they don't know what to do, they do what they know, which sometimes increase the damage rather than uh, minimize or, or put the risk uh, or hedging the, the risks at bay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think
we now have a good amount of time to take questions uh, from the audience. What I would suggest uh, is that I will identify uh, people, state your question. Uh, let's take three at a time because then I think we'll get in more comments uh, from the audience and that's the most important uh, thing here. Uh, and then we'll have some, but not all the panelists respond uh, to questions because otherwise uh, it, it will just take um, too much time. Yes, in the center. Thank you very much to all of the speakers. Um, so there's a microphone uh, coming. Thank you very much to all of the speakers. Most of you spoke about the importance of conviction. Um, I totally share um, this element of leadership but unless conviction is based on a certain important value system, I think it can be very dangerous. And I would like you to comment on that, please. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question about uh, uh, really there's content to leadership. It's not just being a, a leader, because you can be a leader of bad uh, organizations as well. And we obviously uh, in this room care about good leaders and good leadership. So let's have some comments about that. Another question down here in the front. I would ask you about uh, your visions about the new world order, which Gordon Brown states at the G20, um, and in which um, uh, and in which influence does it on the sovereign person? State. Um, Gordon, did you get that? Or should we ask for a little more? I, I think I think the, the question is really: uh, Are you prepared to accept, and how can you persuade public opinion uh, that some decisions have got to be made internationally, which may contest traditional ideas of sovereignty? Is yeah. that right? I, now, am I, I summarizing you correctly? Good, good. So let's come back to that with Gordon. One more question, the woman in the red. My question is for Mr. Koch. Um, why does it need a crisis to be more transparent? Um, you saw that also with BP and the oil spill, for instance. OK, so, uh, so who wants to take up the issue of distinctions between a leader of a of a good leader and a a, a good leader of a bad um, organization Jean-Claude Trichet no uh, perhaps I could comment a little bit on conviction yeah because uh, I think we, we have reflected a lot ourselves in the ECB and myself because we had to explain the non-standard measures precisely these measures that are, were not in the textbook and were not necessarily understood immediately by the people. Uh, after all, an independent central bank is responsible to, to the people. And I found the best presentation, the best understanding possible was the distinction by Max Weber between the ethics of responsibility and the ethics of conviction. In a way, you have to stick to your ethics of conviction. In our case, it's quite simple. I mean, it's stability of prices and through stability of prices, uh, necessary condition for long-term, medium-long-term growth, job creation, and stability, including financial stability. On the other hand, you have to take into account the reality as it is, and that calls for the ethics of responsibility. And the non-standard measure in this reading were measures that were absolutely called because we were in a totally different environment, and we had to be sure that the ethics of conviction could operate in, even in an environment which was dramatically upside down because of the, of the crisis. And I would say that we need both. And uh, Max Weber himself said, of course, they, they look as being totally different and self-contradictory. It's not the case. We need both. And we need both, particularly, I have to say, in periods that are extremely demanding. I think it's a good way of reading what the central yes. banks have done. Might be useful for uh, yes, other yes, reading. Yes. Ehud Barak wanted to say something about this, please. 
Uh, I think, first of all, there are no uh, shortage, unfortunately, in the history of even the last uh, century of extremely bad characters that got the secrets of, uh, hidden secrets of leadership, effective leadership, and led the whole world and at least their uh, nations into disasters. So that's, of course, a room there for this. And we have to be, as citizens of the world, extremely active in seeing the first signs of budding of such regimes in order to block them. And I don't think that the appearance of the major uh, worst kind of examples, uh, Stalin or Hitler, uh, had certain relationship to the crisis that Trichet described as the crisis of the beginning of the previous uh, century, including the deep, uh, the deep, uh, the Great Depression. So basically, the the room is there. The choice is choi uh, a choice of of human people, and we should be proactive in order to make that it not happen. But there are many other cases which are which are nuanced. For example, we are watching from very close distance the Arab Spring that uh, threatens to turn into Islamist winter. Uh, we basically see the, a combination. In the long term, I find the Arab Spring is one of the most promising, inspiring movements. Old people standing on their feet, uh, destroying uh, dictatorships, uh, replace them by the will of the, of the uh, people. But we should be realistic. In the short, medium term, no, nothing will change necessarily for the better. No, the, the Arab societies are not ripe as collectives for the kind of regime that uh, already takes place in Europe or in the UK or in North America. No Václav Havel will emerge there as a moral or, or kind of intellectual beacon. Uh, it will fall into the hands of, uh, of uh, Islamists. I remember still very vividly the discussion with uh, Mubarak, which did a lot for the Egyptian people, but ended up being lost there into this justice cage with, with, without even the <clears throat> support of the United States. But he, when the Americans tried to arrange free uh, elections in Iraq, uh, Mubarak told me, are, are they crazy? They, we are still a tribal society. We do not use this right to vote. Every individual asks the head of the clan or the tribe what to do, and he uses his vote this way. So it's extremely, extremely naive, he said, to announce really free election in I Iraq means to give it on a silver plate to Iran. And in a way, that's what probably, or, or at least we are in a danger of happening right now. So it cannot be easily done, but we should be active on it. That's our role as leaders of the uh, good side, uh, may I say, of the world and, and uh, as a individual citizens. We need to establish a new norm. There, is, there will be no global, uh, global government for many reasons. We need to establish a norm of a community of nations which adapt the same values, namely solidarity, uh, responsibility, both demanding every individual de uh, deserves the opportunity to pursue happiness of whatever potentials the Lord gave him, but every individual, every group uh, de is demanded to uh, take responsible steps. That's basically the reason, and culture matters a lot. Gordon, on the um, issue of the G20 global um, decision-making national sovereignty. Yeah, I, I, j just to finish the last point, it, it seems to me that we're recognizing and having to recognize anew in 2012 that a political system, an economic system, has got to be based on values. And the debate is about what are these right values. And for too long, economics did not get to the heart of what uh, I think is central to the running of an economy. That is, it's got to be run in a fair way, and it's got to be run in a responsible way, as well as being run to succeed uh, through dynamism, enterprise, competition, and everything else. So fairness and responsibility, I think, are being restored as central principles of political economy and I think that's the most important development in economics over the last uh, few years. But I think we're also having to recognize what our obligations to each other as citizens of the world are. And I think that's what's changed in the last 
20 or 30 years that we know we are part of an interdependent world. There's a great poem that says, it's the hands of others who grow the food we eat, who sew the clothes we wear, who build the houses we inhabit. It's the hands of others who lift us up, lift, lift us up when we fall, who tend us when we're sick. It's the hands of others who bring us into the world and who lure us into the grave. And this is a poem about the interdependence, not just within countries, but across uh, nations. And the big debate is, if you're going to solve the problems that we have in the world, environmental, uh, financial, uh, security, and uh, there's no braver person than Ehud Barak, who's uh, fought for the security of his country. If we're going to solve these problems, then we need a degree of cooperation across nations that has never existed before, while recognizing that people's first loyalties and their first identities are as national citizens. And we've got to find a way forward. Now, we have made promises uh, to lots of people throughout the world. Global institutions exist, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. But, you know, think of one case, Rwanda, 1994. And if you go to the Rwanda Children's Museum in, uh, that was built as a result of the, the genocide in Rwanda, you will see a portrait of a number of different children who died in this Holocaust. And there's one I just want to draw your attention to. It's a guy called David, and it says all the barest details about his life. David, age 10, favorite sport, football, favorite hobby, making people laugh, ambition to be a doctor. Then it says, death by mutilation, Last words, the United Nations are coming to help us. And that young boy believed in his innocence that when we made promises as an international community that we would help countries faced by either genocide or by famine or by malnutrition, that we would act on these promises. And I think the big challenge for this world community now is how we can build the institutions that are capable of dealing with the problems we now know can only be solved at a global level and I mean pollution and environmental degradation, and I mean financial stability, and I mean poverty and tackling hunger and famine and malnutrition, and I mean the security issues that Ehud has reminded us of. Now, that is the challenge of this generation, and that's where leadership's needed. But I do say that there is a tension between the national pressures upon you and the global imperatives, and between the short term and the long term. And that's the only way to resolve that is by debate in forums like this about where your priorities lie, where you would focus your most attention, and where leaders can draw strength from people understanding that these problems require a more interdependent world and the institutions that reflect that interdependence. So there is a tension between national sovereignty and global cooperation. There's no doubt about it. But we have got to find a way of resolving it. Otherwise, there will be other children like David whom we're quite happy to make promises to, that we'll have a Millennium Development Goal, we'll have a United Nations that will give you peace, we'll have uh, freedom from famine, and then we don't deliver. Now, that is the root of further tension in the future. So we've got to face up, I think, more than ever to our responsibilities, not just as citizens of our local community and national citizens of a country, uh, but that we do somehow feel the pain of others, no matter how distant they are from us, and we've got some obligation to build the institutions that can help them. Um, in order to make sure that we get a number of questions in, Bryce, I, very quickly, you would, I assume, agree that transparency is important in a leader, not in terms of crisis as well as in crisis, even more important in crisis. Is that basically right? Is it? That's right. Yeah. I mean, the, point, the, the only thing I would add to that is that in a crisis, you tend to just forget about it because you have you have to decide to speed up you don't have the time but it goes to a limit and i would i mean appeal to mr barack in a battle you don't have time to transparency either because you need to decide it to go you cannot start to to be transparent communicate but in a crisis normally you tend to hide you tend to forget to communicate because of time issues and in a, in a corporate it would be important to communicate as much as possible in a government too in a in a in a work phase I think their communication is no time, you just need to go. Okay. So I would differentiate. Of course, it was not the case uh, in the big uh, heroic leaderships of the past. It's a new phenomenon, the transparency, a very important one. Woman in the uh, back, right there, yes. 
All right, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carmela. I am a global shaper from the Philippines. Um, I'm also a 24-year-old mayor. Um, my question is to the panel, um, because I'm so young and I am in a position of power, um, and I deal with a very traditional political system where it's mostly dominant, um, dominated by male individuals um, who are over 30 to 40 to 50, years of age. Um, Sounds what like a panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you Do we feel <laughs> spread some light yeah, or thought? A young version of the panel. <laughs> I know, it's funny. Sorry, go ahead. Um, could you give some advice to somebody who's young as myself who would want to be able to align our vision and mission when it comes to local governance? Because I think you, we did talk about how important it is to have communication and collaboration but when you're talking about um, an untraditional politician versus the very traditional methods, um, what are your suggestions or advice since all of you have already worked um, in that industry and field? Okay, thank you. Down here in the front. Uh, this question is to all the speakers and it's about dirty hands dilemmas. Um, you spoke about conviction and then having conviction of being necessary but not sufficient, there needs to be courage to be able to go through with decisions. But what do you do when you cannot even make up your own mind about what's, what's the right thing to do when you have values but a decision you have to make, have to, something you have to choose, you have different ways that all conflict each other and all conflict with you know, several values that you have. What do you do in these situations where you might have courage but you cannot make up your mind about your convictions? Okay. I like that question. This fellow over here. Um, I have a question considering a problem Mr. Trichet mentioned. Um, he said that the system of democracy cannot respond quickly to, um, to crises. Um, what would you suggest to do about that? That's a fair question. Um, so I, I'd like to go to Jean-Claude Beaver about the issue the second question about indecision. I mean, uh, when you're faced with the problem of, of leadership and it is a crisis, in all honesty, one's beset by a lot of different ideas and feelings and it's very natural uh, to, to feel overwhelmed by that as you're making a choice. What would you say to, to that? I think uh, Minister Barak answered, when you don't know what to do, usually people do what they know, and then they aggravate the Christ. So, uh, <laughs> um, and if you don't know what to do for too long, then I think you are not a leader. Uh, the leader uh, is also somebody who can federate people around himself. A leader gets a lot of input a leader is somebody who shares. Sharing is a very important process. And so uh, if slowly, slowly you can get uh, to know what to do. Um, so I believe, uh, and probably the solution is not always instant. Uh, the Swiss watch industry, we needed a few, <laughs> uh, uh, one year, two years to react. Uh, and it's not uh, important, it's, uh, one day the solution will come. But uh, I, wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't say a leader has to know always the answer. No, the answer comes also from other people. A leader who doesn't listen is a very dangerous leader <laughs> because nobody knows everything. You have to listen from other people. You have always uh, to look, to, to listen, uh, like learning. Many students are here, we have a lot of students. I always say to the students, you will start to learn once your studies are finished. <laughs> during, <laughs> during university, is nothing what you learn because it's the teacher who tells you what to learn. And the teacher gives you the, the fork in your mouth and you eat. But once you are finished to study, then you have to start to learn how to learn. You have to learn how to learn. You have to learn to listen. And, then, and that is making, at the end, your knowledge, your personality. Because you listen, because you look, 
and you are humble and you want constantly to, the, to learn. Quick comment from... Um, mm. I want to add uh, two short points. One, a leader in any area should have a strong intuition about what he is doing that stems out usually from deep understanding of details in certain areas that are relevant to it. Well, not, none of us can conduct a philharmonic orchestra even if many of us uh, love to listen. And none of us can, can enter into an operation surgical room and lead a, a complicated bypass surgery. We don't have any intuitions. We don't have any uh, understanding of, uh, of uh, uh, details. At the same time, I believe that many highly intelligent intellectuals are not capable of becoming an effective leader because they fall in what I call the intellectual trap. Namely, they see the world is a gestalt. You can never describe it in a simple way. And if you are falling into the trap of seeing not just two sides of the coin, but very a dozen of them, all different, all uh, argued for its uh, priority, you lose, you are paralyzed by the complexity of issues. You are probably very good for university and academy. You are not good for leading a real uh, world uh, situation, especially crisis. I, 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 Mark, can, I, can I just add something yeah. for the lady? Um, you know, uh, uh, Peter Drucker, Drucker, said management knows how to do things, but leader knows how to do the right thing. <laughs> it's a huge he difference. means on the left side. The right thing is uh, sometimes on the left side. <laughs> Martin, uh, to the first well, question. Our heart for well, uh, to I the would, first question. I would please. like to uh, congratulate the mayor. Yeah. Uh, I was also mayor, and I know what it is to be a young mayor. Yeah. Her responsibility is very important for all the young people who are in line after her. Because the old establishment will try to use you to convince young people not to run to challenge them. And so if you succeed, you will have hundreds and hundreds of young people running for office because you will be a, a, a good uh, role model. So you have a very important leadership role there. And with regards to indecision, in that moment of loneliness, when only you can make a decision, who do you work for? Ultimately, what is true? Because or else you can make a decision on what is, group, what is good for my group, what is good for the short term, but what is the right thing to do? And um, going back to Switzerland, being a small country in, 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 in Europe and in the world, uh, Switzerland has produced great leaders everywhere in the world. In my country, we have two Swiss heroes. One is Mr. Freiburg, Senor Freiburg, and the other one is Don Bertoni, these two uh, Swiss scientists that came to my country were instrumental in protecting the environment, in, in doing great things for the uh, Paraguay society. And that's why we, we, we like Swiss so much, because you have sent us great heroes. So keep on doing that. You have a role in the world, <laughs> and we're, we need more brains. Gordon, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I, I think the indecision point, there was, there was someone said about the response of uh, leaders in the 1930s to the Great Recession, uh, and it was Churchill, he said, they were resolved to be irresolute, they were adamant for drift, they were solid for fluidity, and they were all-powerful for impotence, and that is not how to lead. And, but I want to answer the, the question that uh, the mayor from uh, uh, the Philipp uh, Philippines put, because I think it's incredibly important about, I think um, women's leadership will be one of the huge big forces of change over the next 10, 15 years. And in a way, I'm sorry, I think we've got to be honest that this platform is not fully representative <laughs> of, the, of the leadership qualities that exist in our community. And um, I think in Africa in particular, uh, and there may be uh, some people here who, who've experienced what's happening in Africa, it's women leaders that are breaking the old system of patriarchy that has held Africa back for too long. Um, and I think there are two films out at the moment in Britain, as some of you may have heard of them. One is called The Iron Lady, 
which is about Mrs. Thatcher, who was our prime minister. And the other one is called The Lady, which is about An Sun Suu Kyi, the Burmese uh, leader. And these are two very popular films at the moment. And one presents a style of leadership, and this is the answer to the, my friend from the uh, Philippines, that is, in a sense, command and control, uh, almost uh, instructing people, dictating to people, and that kind of leadership. But the other film, An Sun Suu Kyi, presents another kind of leadership, which is about how you inspire people to do the right things, how you lead people uh, to do the things that will change things, how you tap the potential of people and by almost coaching them, you move them forward. And Aung Sun Suu Kyi, of course, was never in a position where she actually ran a country, even although she was elected as the leader, but she inspired millions of people to still be resistant to a regime that was brutal and dictatorial and corrupt uh, by the way she brought people along, inspired them, uh, and coached them, if you like, uh, to be leaders of, of the future. So there are two styles of leadership, and I think the second style, uh, which is coaching people, motivating people, helping people make the best of themselves, is perhaps a style of leadership that has been undervalued in the past, uh, and it's a style of leadership that I think will make a bigger difference if, uh, if it is practiced in the future. So you ask uh, what are the styles of leadership for the future. I think uh, coaching people, helping people, leading people on to be better at doing things that you don't do yourself, but people are encouraged to do as individuals and as communities. And that style of leadership, I think you'll find if you watch the film, The Lady, although I'm not uh, paid here to advertise any film today. <laughs> so um, I'm determined to get in three more questions before we end. We have this last one from this round for Jean-Claude Trichet, which is immensely difficult, but it's the point you raised about how democracies are not suited for quick action, and yet a crisis may demand, a huge crisis may demand that kind of quick action or everything could fall apart. What, what is the answer to that? Uh, I think uh, <laughs> what you said, uh, Gordon, was reminding me the certainly a British joke, you know, the man who says, I used to be undecisive but now I'm not so sure. <laughs> uh, I, I think that what, what counts enormously is to make the distinction, obviously, between the crisis management and the medium long-term direction, because these are two different things. And uh, what is particularly different, I mean, to share with your people long-term direction, medium long-term direction, is your job. I mean, they, they, no, nobody disputes that. What is extremely difficult, in my opinion, is to take the right decision in terms of a crisis which is unfolding in real time. And then, of course, uh, the, the kind of, first, lucidity of the leaders. Second, the courage, including intellectual courage, because the character plays a very important role. But, but you have to accept to think out of the box. And it's not that easy. It's perhaps the most important courage is the intellectual courage. And then, of course, you have to get the possibility of taking the right decision from your own people, namely, in very difficult case, from your parliament. And the parliament itself, because there is the interaction in our democracy, real-time interaction, social networks, and so forth. So the lucidity of the people is decisive, as far as I see it. Then the quality of the leader in terms of communication, as Gordon said and Eud Bach said, is decisive. I mean, if your people understand what you are saying and understand the gravity of the situation without panic, without panicking. The right threshold between being lucid and communicating the gravity of the situation without triggering a panic. Uh, I guess it's also the same in a, in a firm, in a way. Uh, but do you think that there, in the structuring of democracies, it is important to take certain kinds of decisions and to take them out of the democratic system, not completely, but the economic, the central banking, certain constitutional rights. There are certain things that we build into democratic systems that free us up to be able to take decisive actions without going through normal democratic procedures. Is that, do you agree with that? I, I, I would. <laughs> I will not make a plea for uh, enlightened dictatorship or any kind of uh, authoritarianism. 
But I think that, that I was not making uh, obviously, I, 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 I could observe myself uh, 17 democracies or 27 democracies functioning. All are exemplary democracies. Yeah. In some cases, there is an historical, very strong, strongly rooted tradition that the, the prime minister says is the captain of the crew yeah. and can take this kind of decision, is granted to take that. In other cases, you have a much more representative democracies and decisions yeah. have to be shared with the parliament. It's a Ehud, I think I'm going to have to go to, to the questions. So, so let's go in the back again with the... Hey, my name is Geronimo. I'm a global shaper too from Geneva. And I was, you were talking about unpopular decisions in the beginning. And I tweeted, so unpopular to who? And I tweeted this morning from another session, um, uh, quoting a leader that was saying, we need, there's this cliche out there of the too big to fail. What about the too big or too important to challenge? And I wanted to ask you, um, there are lots of young people here. How can we support you to take these unpopular decisions? And how are you going to show leadership and take the unpopular decisions we need to take to make peace happen in the Middle East, to turn your businesses into social businesses that respect environment and human rights throughout the value chain? And how are you going to fix the financial system with all of the causes uh, we are observing today? Okay. Thank you for the question. Second. Yes, over here, the woman in the, the back here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. My question goes, um, how should a leader act more also? Using moral and being illegal in some situations, or being legal and unmoral. Yes. I want to, I want to ask the Mr. Ehu Barak, the Defense Minister of Israel, a question, and I want to ask you. We're talking now about um, how responsible leadership has to work and. Um, I want to ask how, how can it work when you're talking about terrorism in all the world and how we can act against it while um, even you yourself as you were in the Mossad you were doing terrorist activities all around the world responsible for assassinating people even who are not guilty and I just want to ask um, how can it be that the state of, uh, of right or a responsible leader does this um, against the law in, in foreign countries terrorist activities with the secret services with the uh, Covered intelligence operations, and the people are just uh, killed when they are when they are um, when they are suspicious, and there is no trial, there is no court, there is no adjustment. How is this responsible leadership? Okay. So let's begin with the let's begin with the issue of how do we in today's world respond to the youth? and the feelings uh, of youth, and make sure that uh, we don't create this sense of impotence among young people about things that really matter to them. Uh, and I think we all probably would agree that uh, the world has, has failed uh, in very, very significant ways. And one of the ways we don't want to follow with that is a sense that, that for young people uh, that the world is incapable of writing itself and, and correcting uh, itself. So who would, like to, who would like to comment on that? I think it's, it's very worrying so when, <clears throat> when our friend says, you will start learning after you finish your, your school. We have a problem with our schools. If the learning is going to happen after, and many people in the Arab Spring were, were, were very concerned about democracy in, in their countries, but they're also concerned about work. And the educational systems do not uh, teach people how to work. 
And so we need to re-engineer the educational systems, particularly in the poor countries, where people, where mothers are telling their daughters, go out of the school because the school is not good for you. So the dropout rates are not because poor people are poor, is because the schools are poor. And nobody is challenging the educational system. So we need to rethink how the educational system will equip young people to live in this world where there are no more factory jobs. Other comments? Gordon. For me, the issue is uh, to answer at least two of the three questions, not be able to answer uh, all of them. To me, the issue is writing uh, the wrongs that do exist and being focused on what we can change for, for the better. Uh, and I think we know, we've just been talking about education, it is immoral that 70 million children are not going to school today because there are no schools for them to go to, actually. Uh, because uh, there are no schools or there are no teachers or there's no books. Uh, and around the world, 70 million children are getting up this morning and not going to school. And we can do something about it. Uh, we can help build the schools. We can help train the teachers. We can help get the technology into the schools. In South Sudan, a country 10 million people, there are only 400 girls in senior secondary school education. Uh, of a population of 10 million, only 400. If it was the same population in any other country, there would be 150,000 girls at school, only 400. Now, these are things we can actually do something about. Uh, and it's quite uh, unacceptable that in the year 2012, we not only have uh, children dying un needlessly through avoidable uh, diseases, mothers dying in, in childbirth through the lack of just proper uh, uh, health uh, care that is very cheap, and children not being able to go to school. Now, we promised that in the Millennium Development Goals we would help solve these problems. The world all came together. Every international institution, every country, every pressure group that I know of came together to say they were going to do something about it. But we have not succeeded. And I just say to us, if we could, as people who are concerned about these uh, global issues, come together and take these issues one by one and say, what can we do? Businesses, what can we do? NGOs, what can we do? Governments, what can we do? International organizations to actually direct our attention to solving some of these uh, basic problems that if not dealt with will leave a world that is disunited, a world that is divided, a world that is unequal, a world that is bitter about what should happen. Uh, I personally have involved myself in this global campaign for education to try and get 70 million to school. I want businesses to sign up to that campaign. I want churches and faith groups to sign up to that campaign. I want the international organizations involved. And I want ordinary people who are wanting to shape a better world to be involved in this. But if we cannot, by 2015, achieve at least one of the Millennium Development Goals that we set in 2000, we will have failed. And the one we can definitely achieve is to get 70 million children at school. You don't need a scientific invention, a technological breakthrough. You don't need some act of genius. You need people who are prepared to spend money and prepared to spend their energies helping get children to school in some of the poorest countries. And I would urge people today to think of the achievable objectives over these next few years where we can prove that by working together, we can actually make a difference. And if we set our attention onto achievable goals, I think there is nothing, there is nothing that we cannot do by working together. Before going to Eric Barak, yes. I would add to that, I mean, you raise a question, what can we do together to make it better? Uh, I think we have, we have an un, a very powerful tool today which exists, and I, I mentioned that briefly before with the social media, especially this younger generation. We know that one, an, every nine person on earth is somehow on the social media or Facebook. We know that Twitter, we talk about millions of tweets per day, I think 19 or whatever million per tweet. So we have a, an un unbelievable powerful tool here to share information, to increase transparency. And as soon as you get transparency somewhere, the decision, the obvious decision, the improvement will appear obvious, will be very easy to take because it's transparent. But one thing is clear, this powerful tool need to be used rightly so and not misused, not with power come also responsibility. So the younger generation will have the responsibility for me to use this tool intellectually correct 
And it was mentioned before, courage is not only courage from a soul, it's also from an intellectual point of view, meaning use that tool, that transparency to really gather the facts and not only one side. I've seen that too many times. I've spent a lot of time in China seeing both sides of the equation, and China is another subject. And, and you see that we on all sides are intellectually not honest. And that is what the younger generation should be. Remain honest, remain uh, uh, interested, curious. Use this powerful tool, which is social media, to get this transparency and these, these easy decision then to be taken. So the, the subject of the discussion here is leadership in times of crisis, not about uh, particular individuals. But uh, Eric Barak, I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to say what you would like, very brief, because uh, we're towards uh, the very end of our program. But. Um, terror is a tough challenge for democracy, and democracy has to be capable of protecting itself. That's the primary contract between a government and its citizens to protect themselves against being indiscriminately, indiscriminately killed by, uh, by a terrorist. So I reject uh, strongly the moral equivalence that you are trying to create between the uh, origins of terror, the terrorists and those who are deployed and active in order to uh, uh, avoiding the terrorists from reaching their objectives or precipitate more terror. Um, I said now, yeah, it's true that I uh, was uh, involved uh, personally. I uh, disguised as a mechanic in a white overall. I personally uh, led a raid on a hijacked uh, airplane of, uh, uh, with uh, many hostages in it, and within 90 seconds we uh, released the hostages by killing two of the terrorists, and unfortunately one of the, uh, one of the um, uh, passengers. Um, I personally disguised as a woman, I uh, uh, led a raid over arch terrorists uh, at the heart of Beirut, uh, after the assassination or massacre of our athletes in the Munich uh, Olympics. Uh, these guys were preparing the next round in terror, and we had responsibility to block them. But uh, 30 years later, as a prime minister of Israel, I sat down with Arafat, the man who basically uh, uh, sent them. And I sat down with, uh, with uh, President Clinton to propose to them the, far, the, the most far-reaching proposal how to put an end. Uh, basically, put an offer that will solve most of the they wanted as a basis for negotiation. We even uh, uh, did not try to dictate to them. Arafat rejected it. But when the issue of releasing prisoners uh, came and we said that we will not release prisoners with blood on their hands before a full agreement is achieved, he said, but what's the case? Uh, Barack also has a uh, blood on his hands. I told him I will never uh, uh, kind of apologize for this. The real difference is that uh, you sent terrorists in order to kill ordinary citizens in buses in the center of the cities, in uh, pizzerias, in the discotheques, in, even in uh, 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 Passover uh, ceremonies, while we were always sent by a responsible democratic government to hit individuals who were preparing the next round of terror. We will not apologize for it, even if it, in few, very few cases, some other people were killed during such an operation. We never went to, we never intended to cause any loss of life of a single individual which was not responsible for terror and preparing for the next round of terrorist attack. So now I need to bring the, uh, the session to a close. I think it's all very uh, important uh, that we hear from these individuals about the very subject uh, of leadership. And if there's anything uh, that I think uh, is the most impressive uh, part of this is the theme of how complicated, so much more complicated, the world has become so much more global and the crises that have erupted 
have demanded great creativity and great inventiveness on the spot, uh, as well as the courage, the vision, the kind of qualities of character that we associate uh, with great leaders. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, thank you for coming to the audience.